Uh, and let's also turn on captions. Actually, it looks like somebody else has turned on captions. Maybe not, because I don't see them. Okay. Yeah, it was me. I turned on the captions. Ah, cool. Uh, are they on for everybody? I think anybody who wants them can see them. Ah, uh, I see. It's enabled, but not uh, automatically. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Welcome to welcome to January twenty twenty three. It's the new allocation year. So, quick uh, rundown of the plan. Uh, we've been following uh, this format for a while now, so it's hopefully become fairly familiar. Um, this is an interactive meeting. It's not meant to be a presentation. So please speak up. Uh, there are not too many of us in the room at the moment. So you can just unmute and speak when we're ready. Um, and we'll run through an agenda of uh, some of our uh, normal items of win of the month. And today I learned uh, we have a whole bunch of announcements and calls for participation. Uh, and then we'll go into our topic of the day in which Rebecca, who's here, will talk a bit about NISC's plans for user community engagement in the coming year. So we'll start out with win of the month. So the aim of this segment is an opportunity for you to show off an achievement or shout out an achievement of somebody else's that you know of. Um, it can be small or it can be large. You might have uh, got a paper accepted, solved a bug you've been working on for a while. Um, it can be very significant. Actually, uh, yeah, we have um, scientific uh, achievement awards, so high impact scientific achievement and in, in innovative use of high performance computing awards. So it could be something that's a uh, candidate for one of those. Um, so I guess around the end of last year, um, in the annual meeting, we announced those. So we had a, a few winners for the last year. Uh, three NERSC users who uh, were honored for high impact scientific achievement, uh, Andy, Chirag, and Bin. And uh, I'm not sure of the correct pronunciation, if it's uh, Giulio or Julia, for uh, in innovative use of high performance computing. And so if you go to this page, and actually let's paste it in on the chat, there's a little bit of a write up about the work that each of those people did. But it doesn't need to be award level. A win is a win. Uh, anybody like to kick us off with, uh, yeah, uh, a, a notable or, or good feeling achievement? Uh, I see a hand up, Stephen. Um, it's not quite an achievement, but I, I could share a little anecdote from a colleague um, who was describing his experience running a science code on Perlmutter, and he said that Perlmutter yeah. is a machine for lazy people. Uh, <laughs> and he said that when he was running on Cori, he was like not very satisfied with the code. It wasn't well written. It was slow. But then when they took it over to Perlmutter, it just ran so fast, they were happy with it again. And so, you know, there. Promoter is a great machine. We're really looking forward to it this year. Nice. That's really good to hear that um, I was able to just pick it up and run. Um, I, I'm hoping that he actually yeah. will also improve it <laughs> to make it even better. But you know, it's it's great that just out of the box, it works so well on Promoter that he was thrilled. Yeah. Do, do you know if he was using GPUs or CPUs? Um, unfortunately, it was probably just CPUs because he was like just taking it over from Corey. And... Yeah, the, the the CPUs in Perlmutter are actually really nice. Like the AMD <laughs> Gen three, um, yeah, it's got great great balance and great bandwidth, um, and it's it's essentially got 
the the kind of you know low latency performance of the of the Corey Haswell nodes, yeah, and more um, with the the mini cores of K and L nodes and the vector processing of it. So yeah, it, it is shaping up to be quite a, a nice uh, system. So yeah, that's that's great to hear that he was able to just speed up and run like that. Kushi. Uh, yes, thank you. Actually, I, I'm second to Stephen, uh, what just he said. So I finally ported one uh, code from Cori CPU to Parmata CPU. Took me some time to change, uh, address those common uh, warning and errors from G Fortran, which is more stringent compared to Intel compiler. So I'm not Great. quite 100% sure if the code is still uh, free from error, particular errors I had to change was order of if conditions. Um, think G Fortran mm -hmm. Intel compiler, slightly different way of evaluating the chain if conditioning. And then G Fortran was more stringent in, particularly in a debug mode, uh, how the variables are initialized or not. But anyway, at, at least the code is running and it's it's much faster on uh, Parmata. It's, it's larger memory and many core. It's really helpful. And uh, the many core, particularly I tested using another code called Wolf, and I did running um, with the open MP and MPI hybrid. So yeah. I, I reduced number of the MPI rank by half, I think. Yeah. And then uh, instead of one, I used four open MP threads for each MPI rank. So that gives me the number of nodes is just a half, but the performance is pretty much the same. So using the, the half yeah. nodes or half the uh, cost charge the project are almost the same yeah. uh, throughput. Yeah. Uh, that's another advantage of many core still and then high memory for each node. That's really helpful for our code and kind of science code that's often memory bounded. So uh, and another thing is yeah. that uh, parallel net CDF IO with appropriate yeah file stripping on Parmata Scratch, the same as Cori Scratch, reduces number, the seconds and time spent on writing output to by 90%, it become 10% of the time. So before serial, yeah, serial write and then no stripping takes uh, 30 seconds to write one output, that becomes yep. almost three seconds. So that's, really another good, great help. So try to spread this word to other users as well. It's really nice. Yeah. So but it's, it's, it's good to note that um, the striping was still variable. Yes. Permata Scratch is um, all SSD. So it should have better latency and probably also better mm -hmm. bandwidth than Corey's Scratch. Um, yes, but yeah, it is still variable too. to um yeah to to use the the file striping yes it is kind of surprised <laughs> yeah that's good to hear and uh, in case anybody here or your colleagues that you know of haven't moved across to Perlmutter yet I you know, highly encourage you to do it uh it's it's really not difficult especially you know because of the you know the the cpu half of the machine or more than half um even if your code isn't GPU ready, it, it can most of the time just pick up and run. Uh, I thought it was interesting your comment there, Pechi, about um, G4 train being more stringent. Um, that So that's an interesting one because it makes it, it, it does mean that it's more work to port if you're going to go through and find all of those warnings, but it probably does also lead to more robust code. Yeah, I think it does make the code more robust. And more, mm. more, how do you say, a closer to the Fortran standard, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And, and more likely to sort of port to different machines in, yeah. a, in, a, in a repeatable way. Yes. And I just realized how lousy domain scientists 
for drunk call can be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised how how old that was running there. with Intel for France. So <laughs> yeah, it was a nice nice experience. There there are some pretty pretty solid Fortran compilers out there that that mm. yeah you, you can get away with a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter. This is not so much a a solve the thing, but in 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 connection to what Koichi said about the um, G Fortran, and I'm telling this off the top of my head. One of the things we had to change was not giving an error message if you had the same function with different types for the arguments. And uh, I think yes, the sure. main place where we have it is say. MPI reduce, which we sometimes do on integers and sometimes on singles and sometimes on doubles. And if you don't set a flag for that, G Fortran just wouldn't compile it. It would say, no, nope, not allowed. Yes, I had that error. Yeah. And, yeah, and so that, I, that is actually something that probably should be documented because I imagine this, that this happens in a lot of codes with MPI. Uh, that is a good point and i we we have now a flag you, and i i can send it to you after after uh, this meeting we have a flag set that it only gives a warning and not an error message on it so there's a flag yeah. something dash legacy and uh, we actually mentioned it in one of the trainings um okay the, yeah migrating uh query to parameter and with the legacy gcc and and newer gcc on parameter now so we could okay. have we could yeah add that information to the documentation the special flag yeah i, I didn't didn't realize yeah. that that was an actual legacy option i might it, it might have been needed in, in addition to legacy or similar flag i might need it to add a specific flag to change error to warning when those uh, arguments right. type are different yeah, the legacy covers possibly that special flag you are talking about. So. Yeah, that's what the documentation says. But uh, when I compile and run the code, that was maybe not the case. But I can go back to my note. If if that's the case, I might uh, put all that on a, a chat or something. But yeah. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, let me check. Yeah, so that actually seems like a pretty good segue into our uh, next normal segment, which is the uh, Today I Learned, which is kind of the, the flip side in a way. It, it can be a win, but it, uh, a little bit more generally, when you're trying things, you often find things that don't work or don't work in the way that you expected. Um, and uh, so, so the uh, aim of this segment is to talk about tips and tricks that are useful to other nurse users. And that definitely sounds like one, the one that we should uh, highlight a little more strongly in the docs. And Stephen, you've got something on this one too. Um, yeah, so it's both a win and a today I learned, though it might be preaching to the choir for this group. Um, so Desi had our collaboration meeting last month and Daniel Margala gave a tutorial on porting co Python code to Perlmutter and optimizing it. And in the course of the hour and a half tutorial, there was a grad student who made his code three times faster by following the tips from Daniel. And mm -hmm. one of the, the key, like today, the grad student learned um, that more NPI ranks doesn't necessarily mean faster and that you should actually do scaling yeah. plots and study your, it, for him, it was the, the MPI versus open MP threads that he was optimizing. Um, yeah. But, you know, he just started out with more is better go um, but by actually doing the scaling plots and studying it um, he found that a different combination made his code three times faster and that was great yep and that that kind of bounces a little bit off what Kirti was saying before also about being able to use half as many nodes and there's uh, it's kind of related really right by using less MPI nodes uh, or less MPI ranks you're kind of moving further back along Amdahl's curve a bit too. So uh, your your efficiencies are likely to be better. You know, it's uh, slight, yeah, there, there, are, there are kind of multiple reasons for a win in using, in being able to do the work with fewer tasks. 
sometimes. And and there's often like a sweet spot too between the number of OpenMP and the number of MPI and it changes from code to code. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, another good tip. Anybody else got a, a tip or trick or even just something interesting that you stumbled across that might be relevant and interesting to NERSC users? So we uh, sort of had a, a few of those already. I've sort of got one that's still that's still brewing in a way uh, uh, in some experiments to discover that um, affinity on Perlmutter CPU nodes can have you know quite a, a significant um, impact. So it's worth uh, you know, looking at affinity you know, re uh, regardless of what system that you're using. So which uh, which tasks are tied to which CPUs, which cores. Uh, so we might move on to our next statement, which is announcements and calls for participation. And we have quite a few, and a lot of these are in the weekly email. So you can go back and look there for details. And a few probably uh, want you know particular highlighting because they're things that you know, we're all going to hit and potentially trip up on. Uh, the big one, of course, being that AY23 has started. I think the change effort date was uh, yesterday. And now Corey's back up. I think Perlmutter's maintenance ends tonight, if I remember correctly. And then uh, that will be back up. Uh, everybody will be using their OCAP allocations for 2023. Um, uh, what I didn't write here is that Corey is scheduled for retirement in a, a few months' time, a couple of months' time. Um, and I think the OCAP awards were based on, you know, mostly. The uh, what do you call it? Allocations were based uh, on mostly on Perlmutter use. So Corey is still available though, but highly encourage people if you haven't uh, moved across to Perlmutter yet to make sure that codes run there and and get prepared for it. Uh, a couple of particular notes. Uh, this happens at the start of every year. Um, we get lots of people who discover that they've been dropped from a project. And that's because uh, several years ago now, we switched from a default of continuing unless somebody told us no to, um, uh, what do you call it? You know, resetting the who's involved in each project at each year. And this uh, helps, helps to make sure that the, the users that we have listed against the project are actually active users who should be you know, able to log on and access it. So we ask the PIs to, essentially click a button in iris to indicate um, who is continuing and it's very easy to forget to do that and the uh, impact of that is that in the new year uh, people will discover that they're not in the project anymore so if this has happened to you or yeah, either as a user or a pi uh, contact your pi in iris under roles there's a from last year button that makes it you know fairly easy to re-add um, project members who were there last year without needing to you know, fill in lots of stuff. Uh, you'll also find if you log into Iris that there is an update to the appropriate use policy and a new code of conduct. Um, and you'll need to log into Iris and read this and attest to agreement. In the immediate term, you know, you'll still be able to log into Corey and Perlmutter but after uh, February 20, you will need to have, uh, what do you call it, accepted the appropriate use policy and code of conduct to be able to continue using Corey and Perlmutter. So spread the word to your colleagues and so on as well. Um, you need to log into Iris and you know, check and, and click through those, read and, read and click through those. Um, Oh, the other note about this year is that don't forget that the CPU and GPU resources have separate ERCAP allocations. Uh, and this is because there's not, there's no real universally valid way to translate between GPU use and CPU use in terms of the amount of resources. You know, it's, it's not as straightforward as one GPU is worth 
three CPUs or something like that. Um, you know, it, it changes from project to project. So those allocations are, are separate. So you'll need to uh, take note of those when you're planning out your usage. Uh, did I hear a noise like somebody was about to ask or say something? Peter? You didn't hear me yet, but I did have a question about that uh, use policy and code of conduct. Yep. Um, so it, I know a lot of users don't actually read the weekly emails, et cetera. <laughs> yep. If you don't do this and you try to log in in March, uh, do you get a message why you can't log in? Um, that is a good question. Probably we check. not. Um, so Peter, what's going to happen is after this time is we're going to disable your login to all systems. Um, and you're basically, it's going to be as if you never, if, as if you were not a continuing user. So you'll still, you would still be able to get your data off of HPSS, for example. Um, but what we're hoping is that by doing this, then that will drive people to iris because they'll think oh my my password must be wrong or something and then they'll um they'll log into iris and then they'll figure it out and they'll sign the agreement and then we'll move on with our lives um it is kind of frustrating to us yeah i mean we can't unfortunately we we can't uh you know beam information into people's heads so the best thing that we could do is send out a weekly email and hopefully they read it. And if they don't, I mean, well, not a lot we can do. Yeah, uh, I will. I will remind our continuing users to do this. But yeah, you may get more tickets right after February twenty. Yeah, I I am sure that we will. Thanks. Uh, excuse me. This is Pooja Adhikari. I actually was uh, dropped out from my project, and I got an email. And I, I, I contacted my PI, and he was immediately able to add me. I just wanted to let you know that. Okay, so I got thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So that's hopefully pretty, yeah, uh, a reasonably obvious process. Stephen? I was going to, it would be really useful if emails could be sent um, either when they get dropped out, telling them why, or ahead of time that isn't just in the weekly email, something with a sufficiently scary subject line. Something, something like a little louder. Will be dropped if you don't do this. Um, you know, yeah, so I'm we, a PI for a 600 person collaboration at NERSC and I expect 300 of them won't do it. And I'm gonna get emails <laughs> the next day about why can't I log in, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, we'll definitely send a, a standalone email, especially if we, if we see that we don't have a high percentage of people doing it, but basically if anybody logs into Iris between now and then, they will automatically do it because that's, you know, that's the first thing that pops up right in your face. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, yeah, but if they don't, then yeah. Thanks for that feedback. Yeah, we'll definitely try to send an, an email maybe a week beforehand. Thank you. Let, letting people know. Uh -huh. Can I just ask, I, I logged into Iris yesterday. I had to read reinitiate all my users because I'm one of the guys that forgot to prove them and um I uh I, I haven't seen anything pop up telling me about the uh the use policy what does it mean that I, I didn't see that oh um can you send me your username I'll see you because maybe you actually did see it and you just clicked on quickly so or something i'll put my username in the chat how about that all right yeah i'll check it out thanks maybe i already did it i did see it have to click it so yeah that is interesting if it's if it's not popping up for some people we'll need to uh look into why that would be would a pop-up blocker block it uh, I think it appears as a page, not an actual pop-up, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I don't think it's that kind of pop-up. Okay, I, I know it, I did get it yesterday and I clicked OK. I did also read it first. That's, okay. Uh, yep, that's even better. You're a, <laughs> you're a model citizen, Peter.
So other things going on. So Perlmutter is currently under maintenance, expected to return to service by 10 p.m. Um, and the, the current maintenance of those, I mean, as, as well as uh, uh, yeah, shut down and bring back up for the new allocation year is we're working to address an issue that was discovered with Perlmutter scratch performance and, and some intermittent availability. So you may have found in the last few weeks that uh, the scratch was kind of hanging a bit more than usual. Uh, and we're hoping that that will fix this. This will fix that. Um, a question came up during the last couple of weeks about uh, job preemption on coal mutter. And I think this was particularly impacting people uh, in the lead up to the end of year allocation when you know, people were, were trying to get jobs through and particularly when they'd run out of allocation and we're using the overrun queue is that the overrun queue is subject to preemption. So it's pretty important if you are getting close to your allocation limit and will need to be using the over overrun queue to make sure that your job has uh, some ability to you know, recover from being killed early. Uh, you know, ideally like a, a checkpoint restart of some, of some type. On kind of the opposite side of that, we have a new preempt queue on Perlmutter for AY23 that jobs are also subject to being preempted um, with the, uh, what do you call it, the, the benefit, the, the, the selling point for it being that it will be quite heavily discounted. So this, the, the capability that this gives us is to put jobs on the system when there's some uncertainty about exactly when uh, they'll need to be killed for a job that's at the front of the queue or, you know, for allowing for you know, uh, real-time type jobs. Uh, so if your job is you know, able to sort of you know, take on that risk of being killed early and, and pick up and keep working with it, uh, the preempt queue can be a way to get a bunch of work in at you know, a very low cost. And in fact, for the first month, we're going to have it at, at a zero charge. So to uh, yeah, give you an opportunity to try it out at sort of your zero risk. Um, the nurse user survey is now open and I believe what will happen is you will see an email in the next few days or so. Do you know the, the timing on this, Rebecca? Um, so they have received emails with the link to the, the survey out. last year. Yeah. Uh, so you're at the end of last year. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we're going to send any more, but it would be really great if you haven't done it yet to please do the user survey. Uh, we we yeah. don't have a very high response rate yet, so. Yeah, and yeah, this is this is sort of really valuable for uh, both our reporting and our you know, justifying the um, yeah the the funds that we get to DOE, and also for identifying you know what are the areas that we want to focus on in the next year. I suggest a um, clear rate if you did send another email with the link. I was a relatively late filler outer, and it took me a while to even find the email from back in November yeah. because it wasn't coming from NERSC. It was coming from some other company I couldn't remember the name of. And you know, if you want yes, people to have MBRI. the link again, it could be really helpful. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if we can, yeah, if we can ask them to do that. Yeah. They may yeah, we can we could possibly get it, or we may. I don't know. We'll 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 see what happens when they end up just mm -hmm. closing it soon, anyway. Or even just having the date and the subject line and the company name in a reminder. Oh, just something something to search for. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> make it easier yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next year, I just need to add myself to the list. I mean, I take out all staff from the list, so I, I just need to add myself to the list so that I'll know when those actually do get sent out because I just don't even know. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so yeah, probably a, a good first thing to search for is the letters NBRI, which is the name of the company that sent the survey. So I've just put that into the chat. So N for November, B for blue, R for red, I for indigo. Um, so some upcoming events. Um, 
there's a Rising Star workshop, which will be held in April. And this is, uh, has places for 30 women who are in their final year of their PhD or within three years of graduating. So if you are or know somebody who meets those criteria and could, uh, you know, yeah, would, would be a good candidate for, for joining the Rising Star Workshop, um, please put in, put in a nomination. The uh, nominations close on January 23, so it's about a week from now. Uh, so yeah, actually, I just got I just got the news that uh, they're keeping it open until January thirtieth. So you have oh, seven more days. Yep. Yeah. Um, we have a training coming up for migrating from CUDA to Sickle uh, with a, a tool for supporting it. That's on January twenty fifth, so next week. There is a international HPC summer school. Uh, will happen in, in July and applications for that are due at the end of January. That accepts uh, graduate students and postdocs from institutions in Canada, Europe, Japan, Australia, and the US. Uh, we have a tutorial on Berkeley GW attached to a conference. Uh, the Berkeley Excited States Conference is mid February. Uh, Oak Ridge is doing training for Frontier. February 15 to 17. Uh, dig up the weekly email. There are links to uh, how to register to each of these. Uh, and Argon is doing its AppSec uh, training program on extreme scale computing um, in the summer, so July 30 to August 11 in the Chicago area. The deadline for getting applications to join that um, workshop, or what do you call it, sort of hackathon, I guess, uh, is March 1. So that's the list of things that are on my radar. Does anybody else here have announcements or CFBs that uh, other nurse users would be interested in? And if not, we'll move on to our topic of the day. Uh, and Rebecca is going to talk about nurse plans for user community engagement coming up. Um, Rebecca, would you like to just say next when you're ready and I'll flip to the next slide? Sure, yeah, that'll work. All right, so next. Okay, so just to um, make sure we're all on the same page here, um, the nurse user community consists of more than 9,000 users from 800 different institutions and national labs. Um, a plurality of our users are graduate students, um, followed by postdocs and uh, scientists. Uh, most, most folks come from universities who use NERSC, um, but of course we have a big contingent at DOE labs and other labs. Uh, so next. Uh, so our, our, despite this large diversity, our users, PIs, vendors, and staff have many shared interests. And so we see that there are actually uh, many opportunities for collaborations, uh, interactions, and learning experiences to be had across our community. Uh, but we don't see this is really happening yet at this point. So we want to help make this and more happen for everyone in the in the nurse community. Next. So we have taken some steps to learn about how to uh, manage a user community and develop our user community. Uh, so several of us have taken this course called uh, Scientific Community Engagement Fundamentals from the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. So, so far we have about a half dozen of us who have taken this. And in fact, Helen's on this call. She's currently taking the course. She just started it. Um, and Steve took it. I took it. Um, several other people have taken it. All right, next, please. So our goal is to create a nurse user community of practice. So what is a user community of practice? Well, it is a shared, it is a community of people with a, a shared domain of interest, uh, actively cultivated and maintained sense of community for those people to be in the community and active practitioners of the shared domain of interest. So those are kind of the three uh, three requirements for it to be a community of practice. So, um, you know, a community like your 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 local city or 
town where that's a community. There's not a community of practice. Um, they don't necessarily have a shared domain of interest. Um, yourself and other fellow um, antique car enthusiasts who like to go to antique auto shows, that's also a community uh, with a shared domain of interest, but it's not a community of practice because you're not doing anything other than appreciating uh, antique cars. But if you had a community of people who liked antique cars and were interested in antique cars and worked on them and, and fixed them and talked to each other about fixing used cars, uh, that would be a community of practice. So hopefully that's kind of clear, like the, the definitions of just, just plain community versus the whole shebang with a community of practice. It in, involves a lot more a depth of interests and of practitioners uh, doing the shared interest. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so why would we want to do this at NERS? Well, we can share expertise across fields. We see that there are many commonalities between workflows, job scripts, data challenges, and more across science areas. So when we, you know, when we at NERS, when we get your queries, we can't hardly tell what area that you're working in. Um, and we get the same types of queries from all different areas of, of science. Um, we also see that this could increase our users' confidence. Um, if, if you have the support of fellow enthusiasts, you can gain new skills and broaden your abilities. And this will also improve the practices of our users. So uh, if other people are using nurse resources better and more efficiently, uh, that helps you as a user and it helps us as nurse. We don't have to uh, worry so much about what's going on on machines. Next slide, please. Okay, so as a first step that we've already taken, we developed a user code of conduct. Um, and that is the best practice for all communities is to develop and implement a code of conduct. So the reasons are because a code of conduct articulates the community's values and principles. So, you, so it gives people a better understanding of how the community is going to operate. It sets expectations for behavior within the community. And it also empowers our community members uh, to handle conflicts and other ethical challenges. Our code of conduct articulates the community values within the context of NERSC, and it's nothing terribly surprising. And of course, all of you have already read it because you've agreed to it, right? Uh, it applies to everyone in our community. So that includes our NERSC staff, as well as users, uh, vendors, any speakers who come in um, to work with us, everyone it applies to. Uh, and currently people are signing it by, as part of the appropriate use of NERSC resources uh, agreement. So all you need to do is just log into Iris. It'll pop right up and it'll attest to your, you'll attest to your agreement. Click I agree and, and you move on in life. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the, the code of conduct, it basically, it just promotes that are the values of collaboration, kindness, and respect within nurse, within the nurse user community. Um, it's based on the Berkeley Lab stewardship values, which are team science, service, trust, innovation, and respect. Um, you know, it, it's just another way of expressing, you know, be nice to each other and all the things that you learned probably in kindergarten. Um, it also, though, details resources for cases of misconduct. So if there's any misbehaviors in the community, there's a, there's a recourse. Um, and then we also provided a, an FAQ uh, with more info on our code of conduct and its implementation. And those are all available on the NERSC website. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we going to do exactly to develop a user community of practice? This is an excellent question. It's kind of with an unknown answer at this point, perhaps. Um, so our strategy is we want, uh, we want, basically, we want targeted activities and groups and experiences. We want it to be cross-disciplinary and cross-project. We want it to be, of course, inclusive and safe. We want to empower our community to make decisions and, and lead in, in areas that they can. Uh, and we want to provide nurse resources. And ultimately, the idea is just spaces to learn and grow and do what the community wants and needs. 
Uh, and so really input from our user community is going to be the key to our success here. Um, we have some ideas of engagement types, so like working groups, mentoring, maybe conference meetups. You know, we don't know. Various things that we think people could be interested in. Uh, and then, of course, the topics of how we're going to engage, what we're going to engage on. So probably some technical topics we might want to do. Um, career and networking related topics. So uh, one idea we had was local a local NUG chapter at your university or in your state or wherever. Um, so anyway, we just don't even, we're not even sure yet about these things. Uh, so next slide, please, Steve. So next week, we're gonna start getting your feedback. So we're gonna launch a survey to get your feedback on the types of experiences or events or whatever that you would like to see uh, in our nurse user community. And we also plan to have some user focus groups in March um, from the uh, from volunteers who, uh, who complete our survey and are interested in joining our focus groups. Uh, so that's our current plan is to get our community feedback and then we will start launching um, events or experiences for users, uh, depending on the feedback that we get. So final slide, please, Steve. So we need you to make this happen. So we really need um, you all to take a look at our survey and uh, fill it out and give us the information that we need uh, so that we can help to launch this new initiative. Um, I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, so I hope Hope to uh, hear from a lot of you about what you're looking for and how we can help. And that's all I have. I could take any questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, any uh, questions, comments, discussion? I. I Oh, this is Koichi. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have questions, but I, I really appreciate this. And uh, also, I, I read through the Code of Conduct, and, the, and there's two documents, right? Code of Conduct and uh, I forgot the other appropriate one. Appropriate use. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then probably in the Code of Conduct, I learned this concept, psychological safety. I was not aware of this idea or this concept. And it looks like it sounds like this is really a nice concept. I might ask my institute if they are, our management are aware of this psychological safety. I really like it. This is something new I, I learned today. So I, I thank you so much for that. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 I didn't know about that concept until I came to Berkeley Lab um, and learned about it here. So yeah, it's, um, oh. it's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for the feedback. Yeah, thank you. There's, there's been some interesting research on that one. Um, the, I, I think the one I've seen a, a little bit from was, uh, I think Google did a bunch of research on kind of its own staff to find out what's effective in building teams that actually succeed. And, and it identified kind of uh, something like five different uh, characteristics that are important for a team and, and psychological safety sort of form the basis of, of the rest of them. All right, well, thank you very much. So yeah, thanks, thanks Rebecca. And so yeah, keep a keep an eye out for a survey about um, uh, what was the topic? Um, uh, experiences and events. So we've actually done a, a little bit of discussion on, on in in a similar direction in in Nugex. There's the the Nug Executive Committee has identified uh, a few things that. Um, yeah, can can be beneficial. So, uh, yeah, it's good to see this. Uh, yeah, this continuing uh, this sort of uh, yeah, work out some plans to to really yeah, develop uh, nurse users as a community of practice. Right. Thanks, Rebecca. So, coming up uh, at the moment, I don't think we have a, a next topic nominated. Yeah, but we are always very interested in topics for topic of the day. Um, 
And yeah, there's there's a fair bit of scope with this. Like you've just seen, it's it's a, around about a 15 minute or so segment that uh, is yeah, a little bit like an extended lightning talk with some discussion afterwards. Um, we're particularly interested in hearing about the work that you know you, the community of nurse users, is doing uh, using nurse uh, nurse facilities. So you know if if you've uh, got something that you're interested in showing off, we're you know, very very interested to hear it. Um, it's a pretty good yeah, good opportunity to give uh, yeah let other nurse users see uh, you know, what it is that you're doing and and how you're using nurse and you know, what impact uh, you're able to have on the world. Uh, we actually have a, a, a link and a QR code here. I wonder if I click this link, does it go through? Here we go. So it just goes to a, a simple Google form. It's fairly, uh, fairly easy to fill out. Essentially, give us an idea for a topic. Uh, it can be one that you'd like to present. It can be one that you'd like to nominate somebody. You, you've seen something that would be good to present uh, or something that you're interested to hear from nurse. So yeah, we're always always on the lookout for interesting things to make a, a topic of the day. Uh, if you've got your phone on you, you can uh, capture that QR code in it as well. And I think that's all that we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're around about 10 minutes ahead of the, uh, well, the top of the hour, which means on the one hand that uh, you can take a, a break before the next meeting. Um, I'll stop the recording now, and but I won't close the meeting immediately. So there's uh, opportunity for sort of further discussion.